It's Commerce of Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. This is the show where we talk about making comics, publishing comics, self-publishing comics, uh, the, all the stuff that goes into the lifestyle of uh, this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoon, cartoonist and teaching artist, and with me today is somebody I'm pretty excited to talk about. We've got, uh, first time on the show, Callista Brill of FirstSecondBooks.com. Callista, what is your job title? You're editor. Senior editor. Senior editor. Yes. That's not what Tin Fam told me last episode. <laughs> I think we've established that you can't believe anything Tin says. <laughs> so senior editor at FirstSecondBooks.com, which I have said repeatedly on this show that First Second Books is uh, consistently proven themselves to be the Pixar of comics right now. Everything you guys do is amazing. And uh, I have been told by many of the authors uh, that are published by First Second that you are one of the people responsible for this well-developed sense of taste uh, in the books that you guys produce. Well, that's really nice to hear. So um, we're going to talk about editing today. We're going to talk about what an editor does. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, you know what it, what, what happens for for the, those who listen to the show and participate on the show. Uh, who say like, boy, I'd love to have my book with a first second logo on it. Uh, what happens once the book is sold? But uh, and then we're gonna close out with some talk about some events. But I want to start with a little bit of an abstract discussion about this taste thing that I hinted at at the top. Um, what an editor looks for, what you look for specifically. Uh, and I'm going to start with the biggest, squishiest question of all. <laughs> Let's try to warm ourselves up with this. Is uh, what, 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 can you characterize what you look for in a great story? Like what, what, what is there that makes you say, this is a great story. This thing has potential. This is, this is something that belongs in first second. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one. Um, so there's some easy, straightforward answers and then a, a bunch of sort of nebulous um, fog, right? And the easy, straightforward answers are that we are really interested in story in its sort of most conventional and traditional interpretation in, in a book that has a beginning, middle, and an end that has characters who, you know, start out in one place and end up in another who are sort of challenged by their circumstances and rise to the occasion or fail to. Um, and, you know, what we are not, what we don't generally pursue are sort of lovely, quiet meditations that don't go anywhere. That's a form that I really enjoy in comics personally, but it's sort of not what For Second is about. So, um, sort of at the bottom line, we're really invested in story. Um, the qualities that we look for beyond the sort of usual, like, does it have a plot that makes sense? Do these characters seem interesting and vital and well-realized and persuasive? Um, we're also looking for, and this is where it starts to get a little foggy and nebulous, looking for a sense that we're talking about a book that means a lot to its author, um, you know, who, who, whose writer has put a lot of themselves into it and a book that has a point of view and a book that there's like personal stakes in, right? Um, so I turn down a lot of submissions every day um, just as part of my job. And um, the ones that are sort of easiest for me to turn down often are the ones that feel like parody or satire or like they have something or that they're a little glib. Right, you know, we're looking for books that feel like they sort of challenge the person who wrote them in personal ways. So, you know, that's this is where it starts getting a little nebulous and right, um, right, yeah, that's a tough thing to pin them, down. Th this is this is the you know it when you see it kind of quality, right? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, like I don't know where it is, but I know what I like. <laughs> but I like this. Like what you're talking about, maybe is sincerity. Is that? Does... Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good term for it. Yes. Which, which is one of those things where you can tell when, even if you don't agree with them, if they're coming from a place where they mean it. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, also on a very concrete front, <laughs> I love cats and skeletons. <laughs> so anything that has a skeleton or a cat in it, I'm likely to think about very seriously. <laughs> uh, 
Hot tip. <laughs> what 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 is it about skeletons that that appeals oh, to you? Oh, I don't know. I've always been fascinated by them. I just love them. Like like the, like just people skeletons or any skeletons? Any skeletons, maybe especially people skeletons, but just in general, bones. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So there we are. Uh, and cats. Well, as a cat owner, you know, anytime I see cats doing people things and it's not some kind of lol thing where it's like, it's uh, like, um, oh, I wish I could remember the name of that book. I was reading this like book from like the 1800s about like cats dressed in people clothes doing things and all those like, like woodcut kind of drawing styles. Uh, I got. Bad. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was really great, uh, except for when we got to the part where they were dealing with a litter of kittens who died one winter and only one survived. And it's a kid's book, and they're dealing with it like very strictly. They're like, "Well, I guess the kittens died. No big deal, you know." Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Uh, that was a little too much for my my poor gentle okay. heart to take. But, um, but sincerity. So you're looking for sincerity. I like this idea of like personal stakes, right? So it's not just like, well, you know, Iron Man's hot. If I just mix Iron Man with skeletons and cats, <laughs> then I get Calista to pick this thing up, right? Oh, and it's a send up of such and such, right? Yes, yes, exactly. But I mean, the, the thing is, is like, uh, you guys can only take so many books at a go, right? So like that, that's part of this, this whole problem that faces you every day. You, how many submissions do you get a day, right? Not as many as, um, well, oh God, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10, right? So okay. a pretty manageable number. Um, it depends sort of on the season. Just for some reason, we get a lot in the summer. I don't know why. Hmm. Um, but not so many that I can't eventually get to all of them. It does take me a long time. But sometimes. you can't green light 10 books a day. Well, no, no. So, I mean, I, the, sort of the sad truth of it is that I'm, I go into these submissions looking for a reason to say no. Yeah. Um, that's my outlook. You know, the second, the, the just combing through it for something that I can immediately say, oh, that's a no. Um, and it's kind of delightful when you're just looking and looking and looking and you can't find anything that says no. Yeah. That's a pretty great experience. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, let's let's dig a little bit more uh, into the specifics of this. Um, hook. Can you characterize the difference between an effective hook and an ineffective hook? I mean, based on the submissions that you've read? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's like it's like a thousand things, right? I would right. have to give you a tally of every single. I mean, I will say that. The, the, the first thing that I look at is if it's not just a script, and we often get submissions that are scripts only because we do acquire books that way, you know, just in, in the text, and then we pair them with an artist. Um, but if there's any art attached to it, that's the first thing I look at, and, you know, 98% of the time I can tell first glance that it's not for us. Mm -hmm. And that's not always because I don't like it. Um, sometimes it's really beautiful art. It's very accomplished and expressive and... Um, you know, technically, technically proficient, but it's not appropriate for first second. Um, and that's another one of those areas where things start to get a little nebulous and hard to pin down is like, what is an art style that's appropriate for first second? Yeah. Um, it's easier to sort of say what isn't, right? Because it's a little hard to define what we end up going for. But generally, you know, we're not really interested in the kind of the mode of realism that's associated with superhero comics or the mode of extreme sort of cartoony stylization that's associated with newspaper comics or, you know, the mode of kind of manga influenced art that's associated with a lot of the stuff coming out of the kind of US manga scene or anything that looks too European or, you know, I mean, so it's like there's all of these kind of like no, 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 no's and I guess the vacuum that's left is the yes and that's a little hard to pin down now we had gina uh up for a second on on episode 65 and for those who have not checked that one out yet it's comicsgreatcom slash cag65 and one of the things that she i remember her saying gina if you're in the chat correct me if i'm wrong on this uh is that one of the things you're looking for is comics or graphic novels that appeal to the readers of prose People, yeah, absolutely. Pe people who may may or may not be all that uh, in the world of comic books, right? Right. So why why them? Why not well, why not why not appeal to the comic store guys? Uh, because we think we can appeal to both. 
um, there's a lot of stuff out there that targets the comic store guys, and a lot of it's really good. You know, I have no problem with that work. But um, I think that there's this. So one of the principles that for a second is like predicated on is that there is this enormous body of people in this country who should be reading graphic novels and just don't know it yet, right? So there's this element of evangelism to what we do, and a big part of that is finding people who love books and who love stories um, and sort of making the point to them that you can love a book and you can love a story that has pictures in it. Okay. So i got to dumb down my, my comic storytelling then. Right. <laughs> um, yes and no. I mean, that's. I sort of don't like saying yes, but there is an extent to which um, I can't think of any in particular. But I wouldn't be surprised if there have been some really beautiful, accomplished books that have come our way that we've turned down because they relied too much on sort of very sophisticated conventions of cartooning. You know, though, now that I'm saying this sounds like bullshit, um, <laughs> I don't think we've ever done that. <laughs> What's more likely is that we would acquire a book like that if we really loved it and then maybe work with the artist to make sure that it remains accessible to people who don't necessarily know every sort of nuance of, of sort of the con uh, vocabulary and conventions of visual storytelling. There was there was a great post um, on the, uh, oh, what was it on? It was um, the Comics Journal, Eddie Campbell, who actually has a book through for a second, uh, The Fate of the Artist, which was a fantastic... Wait, wait, no, three. Oh, which are the other ones? Uh, the Amazing, Remarkable Mr. Leotard, mm -hmm. Fate of the Artist. Fate of the Artist. Crumbs. I'm almost certain there's another one. Well, that's well, not well we, we can we can put it uh, in in the show notes for this episode but Eddie, Pretty sure there's another one but yes. okay but but we'll, we'll link to him in the show notes but yeah Eddie Campbell fantastic cartoonist brilliant storyteller he's one of those guys who when I first discovered his work when I was a teenager it was like a it was like a, 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 a cold gust of air hit me and I said oh that's what comics can be yeah um, he wrote a post on uh, the comics journal uh, with uh, highlighting a few of his rules of uh, clarity in comics. And it reminded me of something that I've quoted often on the show before um, from uh, Ernie, Ernie Cologne, who did the 9-11 Commission Report, was interviewed on NPR, and uh, they asked him, like, oh, did you have a hard time simplifying the 9-11 Commission Report into a graphic novel? And he said, no, 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 cartoonists don't simplify, they clarify. And so I think, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like what you're kind of driving at here is not about dumbing down, about being I extra clear, being very yeah, clear. absolutely. So you could do complex no, stuff, but it has to be understandable to the audience. Yeah, right. absolutely. And I mean, one of the things, the 9-11 report and things like it are really interesting to me just because there are these restrictions with comics. Um, comics is sort of necessarily a, a very expansive mode of storytelling. And prose is a very efficient way of storytelling, and comics just generally isn't. Um, but it's a much richer mode of storytelling in a lot of ways. And I think that also, the constrictions that people work with in terms of page length and things with comics can create, you know, necessity being the mother of invention and all that, they can create sort of wonderful artistic opportunities that you wouldn't find in any other medium. I mean, it's like writing poetry, basically. It's like sitting down to write a Sistina or something. Thank you for saying that, yeah. I, I argue I, with too many of my friends about this, that comics shares a lot of DNA with poetry. Oh, it definitely does. You know, I mean, you have this very rigid form in certain respects, but then within that form, you the opportunities for invention and for um, creative expression are just boundless. Mm -hmm. And and you have a lot of uh, symbolic things that happen with image that are not meant to be taken literally, but are that they symbolize. They make a metaphor out of a thing. Too, right, right, absolutely. And the interplay between the text and the image also can be incredibly rich and incredibly complicated in the way that in a poem. The interplay between the form and the text, or between the text and the next line of text, can be very complicated and rich. I've got I've got one more question on this whole of uh, these squishy questions before we get into the nitty gritty stuff, get into the, dig in deep into your expertise. Um, what's the difference between because okay, well let me let me let me frame this up by saying. Years ago, when Marvel and DC were accepting uh, submissions from people, they had these very uh, rigid guidelines as to what, 
how you turn the thing in. It should be 15 pages, three five-page stories. Here's a sample script. Just show me what you could do with the sample script, but it should be no more, no less, this many pages. You should print them out, uh, photocopy this size, and they should be sent to this specific person. Um, so people are going to be wondering, like, I want to pitch something for a second. What, is, what does an ineffective pitch look like, and what does an effective pitch look like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if we got as many pitches as Marvel and DC do, we could probably institute weird arbitrary rules the way they have, just sort of out of self-preservation, which is, I'm guessing, why those rules exist. Yeah. Uh, the good news is we don't, so I am at liberty to say that I have an equally amorphous answer to this question. <laughs> um, in general, if it's a project, so I will try to actually be concrete because this is a question I get asked a lot and I know it's on people's minds. Um, in general, if it's a project that hasn't been completed, that's being pitched on spec, um, I like to see, it depends on who's sending it. If it's someone I've worked with before, I don't need to see as much as, as I would if it's someone I've never worked with. And if it's someone who's never been published before, I need to see a lot more. Um, so ideally, I want to see a complete script if I can't see a complete script, I want to see a really good outline, you know, like a seven-page outline of the events of the story, because it's important to me that I know that I'm dealing with someone who can construct a story well. Um, if there's art involved, which again, there isn't always, but if there's art involved, I want to see, you know, a couple of pages of character designs and at least three pages of completely finished art that's What's representative this book gonna of the like? right. Yeah, of pages. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of the bare minimum. I mean, occasionally, it, there's no formula, you know, and I also will often go back to people and say, what you've sent me looks really promising, but it's hard for me to make a decision just based on this. Can you show me more? Mm -hmm. So, you know, often that turns into sort of a longer conversation. Okay. So, like, it, it, it less can be, like, even if they give you less than this, if it's intriguing enough, if it's compelling enough, then you'll come back to them and say, well, show me more. Yeah. But I mean, I'll also say, like, I've never gotten a submission and been like, oh, my God, this person sent me too much material. I'm so mad I'm not going to look at it. You know, it's but, like but, I just but, won't read but, all of it if I don't need to. But at the same time, you're, you're, you're planning a minefield here because you're saying you approach every pitch with a bunch of bullets to your gun waiting for the one wrong thing, right? Yep. <laughs> so the more stuff in there, the more dice I'm rolling to get a bad oh, roll, right? I'll figure it out eventually. I mean, that's the thing. I, yeah. I, I have so few opportunities to sign books up because our list is very um, small. Yeah. Uh, so I have to be just utterly convinced of the virtues of a project before I, I bother to take it to our acquisitions board. Um, and so I, I go through a certain amount of rigmarole with people before I get to that point. Actually, there was a blog post on the First Second Books website about the acquisition process, and it went through how laborious this process is. Of like, it's not just as simple as you're going to be a star, kid. Here's your contract, <laughs> and the car will pick you up in the morning. Right? There's it like takes a long forever. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's a slow-moving machine as well. Now, I want to get to some specific things about what happens after your book is acquired. But before we go into that, uh, we need to talk a little bit about your roots here in Michigan. Yes, that's right. You're from Michigan. I am. I was actually born in Colorado, but we moved to Detroit when I was nine. And then I lived there until I came to New York for school. So wait a minute. Did you live in Detroit, Detroit? Or did you live Detroit, in... Detroit, yeah. Wow, not like Ferndale or like the outlying areas. <laughs> Now, do you know do you know downtown Detroit at all? Yeah, yeah. I used to I used okay. to work there for a while. Uh, okay, so you know Lafayette Park. Mm-hmm. That's where I grew up. Okay. Um, in those uh, the like the rows of townhouses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's nice. And I went to um, Cass Tech High School. Okay. And I've got like a lot of weird kind of angry Detroit pride going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many years were you in Michigan? Like 10. Okay. Yeah, years 9 through 18, so I guess roughly 10. Formative years. Yeah. It's a pretty, it's a pretty great place to grow up, actually, I got to say. I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, of the Mitten State. I, I moved away. I grew up in Michigan, but then I grew, uh, moved away for a few years, but then wound up coming back. But uh, uh, Tigers fan still? No, I was actually never a Tigers fan. What? Oh, then you're not a Michigander. <laughs> I'm not into sports. Oh, but you lived in Detroit. You're just down the street from them. 
I know. It's well, I liked the stadium. The old Tiger <laughs> Stadium was really beautiful. I admired it a great deal. It was near my high school. I used to go look at it. This isn't. This is. It, it's not that uptight of a show where we're going to get all <laughs> in your face about sports. But, but so while you were living here, did you wind up going out to any other parts of the state? Because the state changes quite a bit when you leave Detroit. You go twenty minutes, thirty minutes out of Detroit, and it changes quite a bit. Oh, I and, know. I mean, I um, I sang in a choir actually when I was a kid, which was in Gross Point. So I spent a certain okay. amount of time in Gross Point. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then every now and again, you know, for an errand or something, I would end up in like one of those far out suburbs it's like kind of it's a weird place i gotta say did you where did you grow up did you grow up in an I, I no i grew up in central michigan uh, uh which was much more rural i mean like the town yeah. i grew up in there were literally 25 kids in my class who went to a little little old uh little house in the prairie schoolhouse kind of school and yeah like like it, hunting season was a big deal you yeah know, you get two weeks off for hunting season but only a week off for the holidays you know uh, the christmas vacation kind of thing uh, so, but, uh, yeah, I've lived in Ann Arbor for about seven, eight years now and much more amenable to my, my personality, but Ann Arbor is great. Ann Arbor is pretty great, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty strange little college town with a lot of really cool, uh, cool pockets in it. But D Detroit has some pretty awesome parts too. But then like, yeah, then you go to like Kalamazoo. So this is the thing people don't realize about Michigan is like you go to Kalamazoo, totally different. You go to the upper peninsula, way different. Anybody watch Northern yeah. Exposure? So yeah, but anyway. <laughs> It's funny. It's a little bit like New York State in that respect, which is that it's sort of a largely rural community with this one really weird, exceptional, kind of oddball city, you know, down at the bottom of it. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Like, yeah, northern Michigan, it's like upstate New York, right? And, yeah. And all that that implies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I no, but I do love this. It's beautiful. I go. I, I try every couple of years to go up to the Upper Peninsula to camp because it is just gorgeous up there. It's um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit about, so I did my pitch right. Calista looked at it, found no, no glaring holes in it and said, this is good. I'm going to take it through the acquisition process. Now let's talk about what an editor actually does when the book is underway, when it's being produced, because, and this is the way I want to frame this part, is the last 10 years, there's been a lot of talk about disintermediation. We don't need publishers anymore. We don't need editors. We don't even need writers. We could just do this thing on our own, right? And we just put it on the web and people just love it and they just give us boatloads of money. And, and for some people that works. Some people that, that does happen. Uh, but for other people it doesn't. And, and uh, the interesting thing that I think comes out of technological progress and, and wonderful things like the internet and so on is, is it makes new value to new things, but it also makes us reinvestigate what the values were to the institutions that we had before, right? Uh, something I like to say on, I do a podcast with Dave Roman uh, called Kids Comics Revolution, and the way we close every show is uh, the revolution's not about tearing something down, it's about building something more awesome. Uh, so, okay, I got my book, I got my contract, I got my advance, I get to sit down and work on this book, and all I do is turn in pages now, right? That's all I gotta do. Kind of. Um, so, you know, what I was saying earlier about how when I'm looking at submissions, I'm just looking for things to say no to. Mm -hmm. um, I will, if, if there's a bunch of no's in a project, but then the yes is like overpowering. You know, it, do, it does happen that we bring on projects that we know need work in order for them to get to the point where we envision them being. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a conversation I always make sure to have with the author, artist, creator before we go into business together, um, is I, I try to make my vision for the project very clear and have an honest conversation and make sure that they are on board because the last thing you want is to end up in a situation where you've gone into business with someone and you realize that you guys have like totally different goals for the project. So, so there's a lot of like over communication that happens in this process just because um, your experience has suggested that it's necessary. Yeah, yeah. You you just be you put everything on the table with the author. You're explicit with exactly, the author. Exactly. Yeah. You you so, let Tony <laughs> Cliff know that there's going to be skeletons in the Delilah Bur Dirk book, whether he <laughs> likes it or not, right? So can Delilah Dirk be a cat? <laughs> I think that that's what this book. You have to redraw literally every panel of it. But you know, if that's cool, then you've got yourself a deal. Um. So, you know, I can kind of run through the process. Sure. Nuts and bolts of it. Okay. Um, and again, the caveat for this, this is sort of just like the general caveat. Like, I should just staple this to my forehead for every conversation I have ever when I'm talking about this business, <laughs> is that 
every book is different. It just is impossible to apply like a set rubric to every title and expect that to work. So um, whenever I'm sort of beginning the creative process on a book with someone, we have a conversation at the beginning about how it's going to work because I acquire books that are completely done and ready to go and I acquire books that are just like a twinkle in someone's eye, right? And everything in between. So there's sort of a different process for everything and I work with people who don't script um, and I work with people who script and revise and script and revise and script and revise. I work with people who do everything digitally. I work with people who do everything by hand and won't scan their own artwork. Um, so, you know, it's sort of they're all precious snowflakes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just have to be willing to be pretty flexible. Um, and I, I know that I have talked to editors, especially editors who are coming from book publishing, from conventional prose publishing, um, who are taking on graphic novel projects and who are really excited about them but sort of don't know what to do, how to handle it. Um, and. I think the temptation often when you don't have a lot of experience working on this kind of thing can be to sort of say, well, this is how it works, so you, artist, author, go do it this way because this is the only way I can cope with it, right? right. Um, and that's problematic unless you're working with someone who's just insanely flexible and accommodating because um, artists have their own methods. They have a pro process that they've developed over the years, and, you know, it's probably usually in your best interest to work with them and to accommodate the process unless it's something really bonkers or if it's something that you personally feel is like screwing up their creativity and that kind of prescription I offer very infrequently because I don't generally consider it to be part of my job to tell someone how to make things. Yeah. Um, what I am there for Sorry, this is getting very like broad and rambly. But no, please, this, is, this frames up the, the follow-up questions I've got. So. Okay, okay. Well, what I'm there for in general is to be a second pair of eyes. Um, and I'm a very specialized second pair of eyes. But, you know, a lot of a lot of the work that I do is stuff that most authors would be capable of doing for themselves given enough time. Um, when you are in the midst of an intense creative enterprise, it can be very difficult to have any kind of perspective on it. And it can be very difficult to see the flaws in it. It can also sometimes be difficult to see the virtues in it. Um, when you have someone working with you who is not down there, sort of in the mud, you know, I mean, that's a, sort of unglamorous, so down there in the trenches, heat battle or whatever, you know, yeah. um, it can be really useful to just have a sort of an experienced and hopefully talented second opinion. Um, and that's basically what an editor does. You know, I'm not really in the business of making unilateral decisions and enforcing them. Um, I'm sort of mostly there to make sure that I'm working with someone and giving them enough opportunities to improve their work that I'm sort of creating some value, basically. So it's not that famous scene from the Simpsons episode where they're designing Poochie for the Itchy and Scratchy show and the guy saying, no <laughs> attitude, put sunglasses on him. It's not like that. You're not standing over their shoulder telling them how to design their characters. Oh, no, sometimes it's tempting, but that happens very infrequently. Um, you know, the, the sort of the metaphor that we bandy about a lot when we talk about this is that we're in the business of um, diagnosing problems but not prescribing solutions to them. Mm. Um, so pointing out where there's an issue and then if, if it seems appropriate offering some possible solutions but more often just saying you know I think you have a you have a problem on your hands with this character or with this plot element or with the way you're drawing this um, you should think about that mm -hmm. you know and if you agree maybe you want to take it in this direction or I might not even go, go so far but you know what I ask people to do is to at least meet me halfway and to take what I have to say to them Seriously, you know, and if they disagree at the end of the day, as long as I feel they've, like, honestly considered it, I'm happy. Well, you're, you're coming back to that sense of earnestness and uh, sincerity, right? And if they, you, yeah. right? Um, one, of the th one of the things you're talking about here is, like, this kind of flexibility in the different ways that you play. It reminds me of um, 
Linda Berry was just in town here doing a penny stamps lecture uh, at the Michigan Theater. And one of the things she talked about is how the difference between the way children imagine and the way adults imagine. She said that you never see a kid sitting down to play saying with their dolls going, all right, this is going to be a three-act story. <laughs> and at the end of the second act, we're going to leave everybody hanging on a dramatic edge, and then we're going to resolve everything in the third act. You know, it's like, it's like you, the, a creative person has to have some element of play in there in order for it to be honest. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, Mark Siegel, our editorial director, has, um, he actually has a talk that he gives at, and I, I've never seen it, I've only ever heard it described, so I'm probably gonna really mangle it now in my representation, but part of it is, um, has to do with how being a creative person is like being an onion. That you have you, all of these sort of different layers of, of your process and also of your consciousness about your process, and they're distinct, and they each you know, sort of deserve and require a certain amount of attention and acknowledgement, but um, sort of the core of that is that play. Right is the just sort of the unfettered, unstructured, enthusiastic, wild, creative impulse, and then you know that gets sort of nourished and cherished and um, built into structures, right? And some of the structures are creative structures, and some of them are things like when you meet an editor at a convention, do you like spit in their face or shake their hand, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> how do you operate as a professional human being in the world? Um, but you know. The, at the end of the day, it all boils down to like love of making. Yeah. Uh, something. Something. something to, oh, I'm getting some slap back. Is that coming in in the control room, Matt? No, I'm not getting it. Never mind. All right, we won't have to fix this in post. Uh, uh, Tin Fam was on our last episode of Comics Are Great, and one of the things that he said during our discussion that I thought was really interesting, and I wanted to dig into it more with you because it, it concerns you is uh, he said that one of the ways you helped his book was you steered him toward things that were uh, away from things that were interesting just to him and more interesting to an audience. And it reminded me of, have you seen the Pixar's 22 Rules of Phenomenal Storytelling that's been passed around the internet like a billion times? Have you seen that? Yes. Yeah. And it, rule I don't remember anything about it, though. Uh, it, it's... It, it's it's a it's a great list. Can't argue with Pixar. And I did compare for a second to Pixar, but it's like it's like I always get a little itchy when it comes to like these bullet pointed lists because it does sound like a prescription. Take three of these and call me in the morning. But uh, <laughs> but rule number two was you got to keep in mind what's interesting to you as an audience, not what's fun to do as a writer. They can be very different. I'm wondering if we can get some clarification on that point and not just leave it as this simple bullet point. But like, wh what specifically? You don't have to use Tin's book as an example unless you want to. But uh, like, like, uh, what are things like? Because I, I had a hard time parsing that because of course it would be fun for me to see a, a giant robot you know, knocking this building down. It'd be fun for me to draw. It'd be fun for me to see. So why wouldn't an audience like that, right? That kind of thing. It's hard to separate yourself when you're an author. I mean, this comes up. That's I've never sort of articulated it to myself that way, but it, it certainly does come up. I would say sometimes I run into situations where people have, where people have taken their work and made it too personal. Um, and by that I mean that they are referencing... Um, events or emotions or relationships that make sense to them and their brain, but they're not sort of completely translating that, you know, and representing it in a sort of complete and compelling enough way for the audience to be on board with it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that. That's one sort of symptom of that, I guess. Another is, um, and this is something I have to be careful about as an editor as well, right? We were talking about how I love cats and skeletons, for example. Um, you know, and so when I get a book that has lots of cats and skeletons in it, I'm like, give this person a contract, <laughs> sign her up, right? And then I have to be like, okay, I know about myself that I'm really into cats and skeletons. I have to step back and sort of try to evaluate, like, what are the other strengths of this? Is it fun for other reasons, right? And I mean, that's something... You sort of start getting used to that. Um, you be, you get you become with a little practice, able to identify the part of your brain that kind of fires off when it's something very specific to you, as something as opposed to something that's sort of a universal human experience that everyone can relate to. You know, so, and I think that that's something that is great if 
authors and artists can do it as well. And if they can't, that's kind of what I'm here for. So you're there as the advocate for the audience. Yeah, I'm kind of the proxy for the audience. And this is, um, you know, it, it, it's worth mentioning that I, every now and again, it's incumbent on us to make kind of unpleasant and non-creative decisions editorially, um, often that have to do with content um, in our books for younger readers. And that's something, that's a conversation that I try to have very sensitively with our authors because um, it's not it's not something I enjoy doing and it's you know being raised by hippies as I was my own standards of what's appropriate to show to children are very different than the rest of the country is often um, so you know that's an extent to which I have to kind of be a proxy for an audience that I don't necessarily agree with all the time um, we don't often find ourselves having conflicts with authors on this subject just because a, I think people who are interested in making books for teens that have really racy content and then maybe just don't bring them to us because there's this perception that that wouldn't be something we'd be into. And the honest answer is it might be something we'd be into. Um, our rule generally about content is that we, we will fight pretty hard to allow controversial content to stay in a book as long as we feel strongly that it serves the story and that nothing else would serve the story as well. If there's an alternative that does just as nicely, generally we sort of say, look, you know, you can have this book in 40,000 libraries or you can have it in, you know, no libraries at all. Right. What's your preference? And at that point, you know, it sort of becomes an easy answer. It's not the most comfortable part of my job. It's a part of my job I sort of wish I didn't have to do, but it's a reality. Um, and it's something we work hard at because, again, we're interested in getting our books into as many hands as possible, right? And we don't want to, there's an extent to which you don't want to stake something trivial um, against something that big. Right, right. And and to, I, I once ran an anthology uh, for a, a kid's comics anthology, and I remember having a discussion with one of the contributors where they wanted to have a dog bite a child on the arm. Right. Uh -huh. and so it turned into that discussion where I was saying, okay, well, what's this bite about? It's about the horror of a monster attacking you. Do we need to see the gore to get the horror of the bite? Right. That was right. the discussion that we had to get into because, like, if we show the, 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 the uh, you know, sensationalistic image of the bite, then it's becoming about that, right? And then we have to really analyze what that moment's about. Uh, this idea of knowing. Yeah, this, this sense of, because it's a visual medium and it's so much more dangerous. We, we walk such a, a razor's edge when it comes to visual medium, right? Uh, People are really, um, it's, it's sort of shocking until you've experienced it firsthand, which I now have a number of times. The extent to which people react so much more strongly to something visually depicted than depicted in text, um, it, there's no comparison. You know, right. it might as well be like two different universes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, and and that was that was also as as I made more friends in the the, the comics world of uh, book publishing, the traditional book publishing, uh, I'm learning more and more about this idea of a, a new appreciation for the if it plays in Peoria kind of idea, where it, it traditionally gets ascribed to you know it's got to it's got to appeal to the yokels. Let's make it lowest common denominator. Let's make a reality show where you know kids just pour beer on themselves. Uh, but what, what the, the origin of that expression where it's like, okay, can we do this and have it still be powerful but be as inoffensive as possible to, because let's face it, you know, we talk about Michigan having all these different geographical areas and all these different cultures, right? The United States has that, <laughs> right? Yeah. So. I, it's, it's tough, right, because it's one of those rules that you want to apply with the most delicate touch available. Um, and that's something that we think about a lot. It's actually something we've been talking about a lot recently with a book that's in pre-production right now. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's kind of been on my mind. Um, and there, there have certainly been cases in the past where we've gone to an author and been like, look, the path of least resistance here is to just take this panel out or like put a shirt on her or whatever. And then we get a response, and the person says, all right, but I really think this is important for reasons X, Y, Z. And then we say, okay, you know, you talked us into it, we'll stand by you. So it's not, I, I'm a little, I want to be careful about making us out to sound like we're sort of these, like, monsters of the, like, censor stamp. Because I think that there is sometimes this perception that um, 
uh, comics publishers, like especially comics publishers who are operating as for second does, out of the framework of a large established conventional publisher like Macmillan, are sort of in the business of like sanitizing comics right. and, and like right. palatable to assholes. Um, and that's not at all what we're about, you know. And I sort of, I just want to, I want to explain to the world that that's not what we're about. Right. Well, what what I think you're doing a good job of is describing that it's complicated. There is there are a lot of wheels going on and cogs twisting in this machine of getting your wonderful dream into paper, into a bookstore and library, right? Uh, and it's not just the creative decisions, but there are some kind of, you know, uh, crass marketing decisions that need to be made in conjunction with the creative decisions. And sometimes creative wins out, sometimes marketing wins out. It depends on how the conversation goes, but it's not as simple as, uh, you know, you want to Disneyfy the world of comics, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's one of the things that's, it's one of the trickier parts of my job specifically of being an editor is that you are sort of constantly, um, advocating on the one hand for the sort of the complete pure unfettered creative expression of the work and advocating on the other hand for the sort of more market driven part of your company right mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that you know Mark and I Mark Siegel our editorial director talk about this a lot just um, kind of ways of ways of doing that awkward dance as gracefully as possible I guess I mean the good news is and for a second is sort of um, the proof in the pudding. That's an expression, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. I've heard it before. Yeah. Well, we were sort of like um, a, a standing um, illustration of this, that that doesn't always have to be a conflict. Um, in our case, it sort of rarely is, actually. It does happen um, that there's one thing that feels like it's perfect for the book, for the sort of pure creative expression of the book, and there's another thing that feels like it makes more sense for the marketing of the book. But even in those cases, there's often a very happy third option that suits both ends. So, uh, you know, it's it's something that requires a lot of attention and a lot of energy, um, but that in the end doesn't very frequently end up requiring any party to make significant compromises. So that's nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I've talked with Tin Fam, I've talked with Dave Roman, who have both worked with you, and they have nothing but wonderful oh, things to say dudes. about you. Yeah, they they both are really really great guys. Uh, but they they had nothing but nice things to say about you. So I mean, uh, the, you've managed to navigate these dangerous waters well. Uh, at least speaking for for you, right? Uh, well, I'm happy to hear you say that. I mean, I, I do try. It's, <laughs> I spend almost all my time on. So. Uh, okay. Well, you know, we only got a few more minutes till book recommendation segment begins. I'm waiting for Sharon to get here. Um, but while we wait for Sharon, we have to... Oh, there she is. Okay. We have time. We have a couple minutes. Talk about walking on the edge of a knife. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. You wrote a blog post back in... What was it? January? It was at the beginning of the year. Yeah, I think it was in January. And I think the blog post read, um, I hate comics. I hate everybody who makes comics. And if you make comics, fooey on you. Wasn't that the, 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 the title of that one? Well, you missed the introduction, which is <laughs> me, important publishing lady. <laughs> That's right. Yes, <laughs> but you made you, you you ruffled some feathers and you got some really great conversation started. Let's just let's be clear about that. And this was uh, the blog post uh, when to give up, which we will link to in the show notes. And it was kind of addressing some of the things we've been talking about today. This idea of like you get a lot of proposals and you get a lot of uh, different ideas for things. Some of them are great. Some of them are like, mm, you know, maybe you should rethink this thing. And so, uh, and, and you since have posted a clarification on the blog post as well because of all the, co the conversation that came out of this. But w what was unfortunate was that a lot of people had the knee-jerk reaction of, she's telling us that we shouldn't do it, right? And that's not what you were really saying there, right? I'm it's not. I'm, so mistake number one, mis uh, let me just say, mistakes were made. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I stand by the content of that post. I wish that I had put more time into explaining, into phrasing things as sort of precisely and with as much nuance as I think it required in retrospect. Yeah. But um, I should not have titled it what I titled it. And I, I confess that when I gave it that title, I was sort of thinking, "Well, oh, this will get people's attention," and then it really it was did. provocative. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the, I could uh, I put a lot of thought to this, right? I could talk about it for like 20 minutes. But um, I will just say that uh, 
part of my job and, and a part of making comics that I think people sometimes don't think about or don't want to think about um, is, but that I have to because I am, for better or for worse, I am I'm part of the economic picture, right, for the mm -hmm. cartoonists that I work with. Um, whether you should be making comics as a just creative expression of your own, you know, creative drive um, is your business entirely and nobody else's. Um, whether you might want to consider not trying to make money from comics and find something else to make money from um, is a topic that a lot of people have a lot of things to say about. And one of the things I was sort of trying to say, and again probably sort of ineptly, um, is that that's a, another question that is sort of ultimately only your call. But it is a question that there are people in the world who can advise you well on. Um, and that those people's advice should be one of like 11 different factors that you consider when you're thinking, is this really an income source for me? Mm -hmm. Can it realistically become an income source for me? Um, and that, you know, ultimately you shouldn't be waiting the opinion of an editor or an art teacher over these other many different factors, but that, you know, that is part of the picture. The whole thing. <laughs> The reason I wrote this, it's just pure contrarianism, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm a big fan of, of the kind of like, kind of rah, 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 sis, boom, bah, like sisters doing it for ourselves, you know, like the, my art school teacher told me to get out of the game and I persevered and look at me now. Like I find those stories very moving. Yeah. And, you know, I think that people should persevere if they feel strongly that they want to. But um, it kind of got me thinking like, okay, what are the circumstances then under which it would actually be useful to hear an industry, an industry pro such as myself say, hey kid, get out of the game. What I kind of failed to make clear in this, and which I think has led to some maybe misconceptions about me as a person, is that I have literally never in my life advised someone not to make comics. And I have actually literally never in my life advised someone not to try to make money making comics. So. This is not me that I'm talking about, really, but I think that there are people who sort of feel like part of their responsibility to the young people that they deal with is offering them sort of a reasonable assessment of their chances at having a profitable career making comics. And that, you know, the opinion of those people isn't worth, it's not the only thing you should be taking into consideration, but it's one of many things. So, there, I've said my thing. And, and yeah, I think something that is, it is very easy to forget uh, when we in, it, engage in discourse on the internet is that there are people on the other end of these things being said. And uh, you know, even though you were posting on the first second blog, these were the thoughts of a person who is open to to debate and discourse on the subject. And that uh, a statement on the first second blog is not an edict <laughs> that the rest of us. I mean, it's like yeah, it's like I my my you talk about art teachers. My high school art teacher actively tried to talk me out of doing comics for a living. She said to me. You know, that's not real. She was come from the same, but this was the, the, the 90s, early 90s. She said, it's not real art, you know, uh, you know, you should really try, to, you know, oil painting instead. And my reaction was... You'll make good money oil painting. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's going to work out for you. But, but the, the funny thing was, is my reaction was, well, I'll show her, right? It's like, I, I yeah. want, right? So... If, I mean, a lot of times that kind of feedback can sort of provide a useful, something to push against, right? Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, when I went back to visit her after uh, I graduated and I, and I self-published my first book, it was specifically to kind of hold it in their nose. And then she huh. she popped my balloon by holding it up to the class and saying, this is my student. <laughs> you know? I was like, no, 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 you're not supposed to be proud of me. You're supposed to be disappointed. <laughs> but but anyway, but yeah, it, it's... It, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that it, it, it turns into inflammatory stuff, but it, it brought up some good discussion. I mean, Dave Roman wrote a great follow-up blog post on his Astronaut Academy website, uh, Before You Give Up, Try Changing It Up, which we'll link to in the show notes. Fantastic article. Uh, give it, you some more food for thought. It is really fantastic. I mean, I, I should make clear, like, I, mm, I, maybe this is not, like, a good sign about myself. My feelings were not especially hurt by that whole flap. I was a little taken aback, um, but I also, I guess I just feel like, I, my understanding of myself is someone who's sort of trying to do good in the world and who is generally kind of virtuous and supportive, I guess, <laughs> uh, is strong enough that when people say, like, look at this sort of, look at this 
lousy excuse for a human being, I kind of think, oh, well, that's clearly not me. So right. Yeah, well, I, it's just, it's hard to take the really inflammatory stuff too seriously. And then the stuff that's thoughtful is actually really interesting and useful. So for the most part, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty interesting. So that, I, that was my only regret is, you know, if I hurt anyone's feelings basically, which I didn't want to do. Well, that that's their decision, not yours anyway, right? But I mean, I, I think you you responded like like an adult, and that flies in the face of what Tin Fam had to say: is that you're not some v wonder kid, kid. <laughs> <laughs> but, but a real grown woman with uh, anyway uh, so okay we've got to get the book recommendations and yeah, then we yeah. got to close out with some talk about some events going on and I am happy to see Sharon Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library has returned to yeah. the Comics are Great studio good to see you good to see you is, is your mic on am I hearing is you? my mic oh on? there you are I hear okay, you now. okay I have to like eat mind the mic <laughs> to be heard yeah you got to mind your <laughs> mic technique you okay stay in like this right okay. all right so okay so Sharon you brought a whole mess of we're 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 uh, paying lip service to you, Calista. We are because I had three. <laughs> I, love it when that happens. I I had three books, and I dashed when I saw Jersey's email, and I went for a second, for a second, no, 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 and I went, oh come on, I've read a ton of first second books, so I dug out several today just to show that libraries are big supporters of first second, and in fact, <clears throat> over lunchtime, I just read Sumo. And um, isn't that a great book? Yeah. 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 I, I, I need to go through it again. I mean, what, it, without spoiling the ending, what did you think of the ending? I, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I it, mean, yeah, v the visual was stunning, you know, from that opening and then to close that way. And yeah, yeah I loved it. I've had some discussions with some friends who are in, in, in Tin was right. He, people are diametrically opposed on that ending. Some people are like, wait a second, you know, and but then I'm like, no, it no, was poetic. It's, no, it, it was anyway. wonderful. Yeah, it was yeah. really great. So. Yeah. So I just I, I read that. Um, I, I told Jersey when he when he saw my list, he was said, oh, my God, I got to have more time. <laughs> but of course, one of my favorites is Legends of Zeta Legend, and yeah. the Space Girl. I talked about her before. And the thing that I kind of noticed, uh, Feynman by Ottaviani and, um, uh, that's a great and Myrick, too. is that as I looked at the stack of books, American born, um, Chinese, it's such, so many of these stories are character driven and, you know, but there's really a solid storyline behind them. This is one, um, The Silence of Our Friends, that I have in my stack to read at home. And, um, uh, I can't wait. This one's... I have not read this one yet. Oh, yeah. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> yes, yes. Did you edit this one, Callista? Yes. <laughs> well, we, we do May school visits, and I uh, when I saw that it was civil rights struggle, um, was never black and white is kind of the sub listing there, that I thought, oh, this would be great to take into schools. And then, of course, Astronaut Academy. Astronaut Academy. And, Zero uh, gravity. And there's a new one coming? Yeah, May 14th. We're going to talk about that in okay. a second. Well, actually, no, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt Book Talks just for a second because right. this is important, everybody. Astronaut Academy Day is May 14th. May 14th, 2013, the second book of Dave Roman's excellent. excellent. Oh. There's, the, oh. there's the, let's see if we can get it up on the cam. Hold it up just for another couple seconds. We'll pull it up. There it is. Fantastic. In all of its gold foil glory. Uh, so I'm running a contest on my website, comicsagreat.com slash AA Day. And all you got to do is share some love for Dave Roman's wonderful Astronaut Academy, which is serializing as a webcomic right now. Before the book comes out, you get to read it for free before it even hits stores, right? And uh, if you just share a link to it, if you take a picture of yourself with the book on release day, um, if you do some fan art of the comic, or if you uh, just do a, or write up a review on Goodreads or Amazon, uh, what can you win? You'll be entered to, oh, and you have to share a link to the thing that you did uh, on Twitter with the, uh, Astronaut Academy Day as the hashtag. And I'm going to be following those hashtags, and, and I got a whole mess of prizes. Check this out. Okay, prize one, not first prize, prize one. Uh, you get to co-host the Comics Are Great show with me to interview Dave about the Astronaut Academy, just like we did with Arena last mm -hmm. December uh, for Drama Day. Prize two, an original drawing of the Amulet characters by Kazu Kibuishi. He sent it to me. Wow. I've got the drawing in my possession. It's gorgeous. <laughs> I can't believe that he gave that to me. Uh, I want to keep it. Uh, 
Prize 3, over 600 pages of digital comics by, including these authors, Ben Hatke of Z to the Space Girl, mm -hmm. Greg Schiegel, who's been on the show before of the Stuff Said Podcast. He draws the SpongeBob comics. Casey Van Heist of Winters and Lavelle. Brandon Dayton of Green Monk. John Green of Teen Boat. Ryan Estrada of Aki Alliance. And then I'm even throwing in uh, a 66-page story that is out of print. You can't get it anymore uh, called PPV Pay-Per-View. It's a comic I did back in 2002. It's really funny, but just out of print, so that's the only way to get it. And then we've got signed copies of Chris Giarusso's G-Man as a prize. Wow. He sent me two copies of, of the first two books with sketches and signed on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and then an original sketch of one of the characters from Astronaut Academy by Chris Giarusso of G-Man. So that's just for starters. More prizes are coming, but we should get... The, I want to put this book on the bestseller list uh, month one. And so the best way to do that is to share fan art, blog posts, uh, book reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. Well, Goodreads is now part of Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and leading up to, to build some steam up to the, the main event on May 14th. And the details are all at comicsagreat.com slash AA day. And then I also made another uh, fast link to comicsagreat.com slash word, which goes to Dave Roman's Astronaut Academy pre-order event. Do you know about this, Calista? I assume you do. <laughs> <laughs> so what's yeah, the deal um with this? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I wanted, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about the pre-order thing if you wanted to. Well, so through the Astronaut Academy website, there's a lot of instructions on how to make this happen. But basically, a local bookstore, Word, which is a terrific independent bookstore, is organizing this pre-order event. Um, and they are, I believe all of these books will be signed by Dave Roman. I'm a little foggy yep. in the details, I yep. have to admit. But um, pre-orders are terrific because it basically it creates a sort of a... Um, <sighs> For technical publishing reasons, they're really <laughs> desirable. Um, it creates advanced buzz. It gives people sort of a sense of what's coming down the pike for the book. So it's always, you know, editors love it when this happens. And Astron Academy is such a phenomenal series. And I think, you know, Dave's fans are legion and will be delighted to have a chance to get sort of early on the action there. And, and there's a prize that's being offered as well. Actually, um, Dave tied this in with the contest I'm doing, that every pre-order counts as an entry into the Astronaut Academy Day contest on my site, and you can be entered to win an original sketch of you in the Astronaut Academy style by Dave. That sounds the, the yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that is awesome. So the details are at comicsagreat.com slash word will take you to the, the, the page on Dave's site with information about that. So. Astronaut Academy Day, May 14th. That's all we need to remember for sure. Go to your local bookstore, uh, independent bookstore, and buy it that day. Okay, Sharon. Well, I'm that sorry. was, that was, uh, I'm glad I brought that book with me. Yeah, today. yeah. That's my own book. I uh, figured that was one that, less. I, I saw I, that it was signed, so yeah, I didn't know if he signed the library's yeah. copy or not. But no, no. Well, he might have, but I <laughs> have my own. Awesome. So, no, I just, um, I could go on and on because First Second has just done an outstanding job of bringing books forward. Um, I, I listened to a little discussion before I came in here. That's why you didn't see me. I was kind of oh. hunkered down Yeah, you're hiding in the control room. And I, and I just, you know, some um, first second did Prime Baby by Jean Yang, right? Yeah. And, and you know, the thing that I find interesting um, is, the, is the decision to make books a kid book, a, you know, a teen book or uh, an adult book. And, and because sometimes books like Prime Baby... I mean, an adult could read that and, you know, mm -hmm. take away a lot from it. And I think, I don't know, sometimes graphic novels are more challenging to figure out, you know, where Who they it's fit. For. And it's not just from the publisher angle, but also from the library's angle. You know, where, where does that book, where will people pick it up? You know, encounter it and pick it where up. Where do where do I shelve it? Exactly. Right? Is this, exactly. Does this go over by the chapter books? Is this going in nonfiction? Where am mm -hmm. I putting this thing? Right. Yeah. 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 So so that was just this little side piece. And the other thing that I I brought a couple other books um, that I thought was kind of fun some weeks ago, months ago. I'm not sure when. <laughs> I talked about Louis Trondheim's Monster. God, that Mask. guy is so awesome. And. When I read that, I thought, oh, cool, you know, people who sketch monsters and they come right off the page and so forth. And then I was just straightening books in our youth area just a couple weeks ago, and I found this book called Sketch Monsters, um, Escape of the Scribblers, and, or Scribbles. And I went, oh, my God, this person, this is Joshua Williamson, Vinny Navarrete, and, of course, Trondheim. I was like, they stole Trondheim's idea, <laughs> except, and, you know, I'm thinking when you get books like that, you're like, at, at a, 
publishing house, and you're like going, uh-oh, you know. But this, the Sketch Monsters, um, kind of takes it off in a different direction. It's about a little girl whose older sister has gone off to college. I guess I have to hold it up, right? Oh, I yeah. Think I, uh, yeah, the, the, the sky cam it. isn't working right now, so. And she's eight-year-old Mandy, and she's really bummed out. And she's also a kid who doesn't show emotions at all, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, look at that picture on the cover. And yet when her sister leaves, she gives her this blank sketchbook that Mandy, the first day, night, just sketches like mad. And it's a bunch of monsters. And in the night, um, they escape from her book. And the thing that happens, the basic storyline, is in order for them to quit drawing all over the walls in her parents' house and escaping out into the neighborhood, is for her to um, express the emotion that those monsters are expressing. Oh. For her, a girl who's fairly emotionless has got to recapture them. And so it, it takes it in a very different vein from Trondheim, who takes monsters who are just wreaking havoc everywhere, yeah. um, paper though they are, and creating a total chaos and destruction, and how do you deal with that, to something quite different. And I just thought, wow, okay, so similar story ideas. But very different execution. Very different execution. Yeah. So that was kind of fun. Um, and different character development and so forth. So it's, yeah, it's like, it's really fun um, taking a look at all these books. Is that other Trondheim book a first, second book? Or is that somebody yes, it else? is. Tiny, Tiny Tyrant. Tiny, Tiny Tyrant. Everything Trondheim does, people oh, should read if you love comics. Yes, yes. And I haven't read this one, but I got, I got just a little taste of this Tiny kid who um and his bodyguard and how he's trying to fool him in one scene of you know jumping out the window and he's going to try to one up the the bodyguard and no matter what bodyguard <laughs> is there um to capture him and keep him i guess safe if you will uh. but anyway yes there are books and i i thought you know as i sent the list to you. I was like, no, I'm just going to kind of show the books. Uh, okay. I'm not going to like talk all of them because we, well, we should give a shout out to Reed Gunther too, because there's another Michigan native, a yep. Mi Michigan expat. Actually, he's in, he's in LA now, the, the skunk, but, but he was here for a long time. Uh, and I, and I confess that I did not read, um, his, I've had this book at home and it sort of keeps, it kind of kept getting set aside, set aside. And when I read it, it was like, why did I leave this on the side? A cowboy who rides a bear in the Wild West and goes on adventures. Well, Enough and, said. And zombies. Wait, what is this book called? It sounds amazing. Reed Gunther. Reed Gunther. Gunther, okay. The Bear Riding Cowboy. The Bear Riding Cowboy. Yeah, it's by Chris, oh, Chris and Shane Houghton, who also work on the Bongo comics, Simpsons comics. Right. Wildly yes. funny guys. Wildly really? funny. And, and the characters are hilarious. I yeah. mean, the scenes, the scenes work out. The... You know they're they're overplayed, but in the end, there's humanity, there's humor, mm -hmm. there's total excitement, nonstop action, and yeah. all of that good stuff. So, yeah, a lot of fun. I'm so glad I finally picked that up. And it's it's read a great it. book. Yeah. So, Callista, do you have any book recommendations that you want to throw out? Anything that we should be uh, extra excited about beyond Astronaut Academy? Any yes. Let yeah. me grab a couple. Okay, she's going to grab a couple. I'll, I'm, okay, you go grab those, and I'm going to do... Um, we got to make note about an event. <gasps> we do, we do. Oh. This Sunday. April 7th. April 7th, 1 to 3 p.m., Sally Carson <laughs> is going to organize every cartoonist uh, in Ann Arbor or, <laughs> you know, beyond. And um, she's going to come and talk about taking all the bubbling list of ideas that you generate and organizing them organizing. and and something called an affinity diagram how you can work to make those ideas you know not just a, a jot down on a slip of paper thrown in a folder but actually make um, sense of it and make it useful in some future project sally carson who is fixpert on twitter mm -hmm. um an exceedingly clear thinker very much, and I I am really looking forward to this talk. Um, so yes, that is at the at downtown Ann Arbor District Library, April seventh from one to three p.m. on the fourth floor mm -hmm. uh, meeting room, mm -hmm. 
And this is a free monthly event that we hold at the Ann Arbor District Library. Every month, the first Sunday of the month, there's a free uh, get-together where cartoonists from all around the Southeast Michigan area get together just to draw together. But then we always have a guest speaker who does like a 40-minute thing. And it's usually very thought-provoking. Last time we had Laura Uy of, mm -hmm. uh, of um, Poltergeist. Poltergeist. Talked about Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, we've had uh, Matt Fizell do talks, I think. No, he, yeah, did, he did. Did he? Did. Yep. Uh, Dan Mishkin did a talk mm -hmm. for us. Uh, it's, it's always, always a good time. So, yes, if you are in the area this Sunday, April 7th from 1 to 3 p.m., and that's at comics.aadl.org for more information. So, did I, did I vamp enough for you, <laughs> uh, Callista? That was awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you um, got? Well, I'm not going to belabor this too much. I did want to say the cartoon, the comic that you were describing about the little girl who draws. Oh, don't don't. Has monsters and it sort of has to own own those expressions. Uh -huh. um, it reminded me about this book dude called I Kill Giants. Oh, which is so yeah. Wonderful. yeah. Yes. So about sort of oh, it's terrific, and it's also about grappling with like really powerful sort of unnameable emotions as a kid, um, mm -hmm. and it's. It's a really special book, so whatever. I recommend that one. Mm -hmm. I have a few first second books to talk about, um, most of which I actually have in my hand, except for Nothing Can Possibly Go Wrong, um, which is the new Faith Hicks book. She's collaborating with a newcomer named um, Prudence Shen. And it's lovely. I don't have it in front of me, but it's sort of a... Um, it's about it's monster robot, robot battle competitions, but not yeah, giant robots, right? Right. No, it's it's about high schoolers who are involved in a robotics club, and um, they have a conflict with the cheerleaders, and it all culminates in a battle bot competition, and it's very funny. It's sort of a screwball comedy about you know hapless teenagers. It's I, terrific. I, anybody who's a fan of the Goonies type movies, right, mm -hmm. would probably dig it. Like a, a good cast of characters all screaming at each other, like cats in a sack, while totally. they try to solve the problem. Cats in a sack is exactly what you're looking at here, <laughs> and that was serializing online as well. Um, and we're doing a um, pre-order campaign for that also, which may not have been announced yet, but will be presently announced if it is not already. I'm a little hazy on those details. Okay. Um, but of course, we have Astronaut Academy coming up, which is so shiny. <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday was the pub date of Lucy Nicely's new book, Relish. Um, mm, is yeah. everything backwards for you guys? No, nope. no, that's just okay. your screen. Okay. <laughs> Um, Relish is a memoir about food and cookery, and Lucy, if you don't know her work, is a terrific web cartoonist as well as a, another as a published graphic novelist, and um, just wonderfully talented and very good at talking about herself in ways that are very um, funny and accessible um, and yeah, and, exactly. And they she's speak to broad saying. broad human experiences. She, we've we've talked about her on the show before. Yeah, she's gotten some high recommendations from uh, Ann Arbor District yeah, Library I'm, staff. Like, biggest fan. I think she's amazing. Um, and then we have a book coming out. You guys were talking about Feynman earlier. Mm -hmm. um, by that same author, Jim Ottaviani, Primates is coming out this spring, and this is about Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Beerte Galdicus, who are sort of the trio, like the great three lady primatologists of the 20th century, and who, between the three of them, have really done more for conservation in general than pretty much anyone else. Um, so this book is amazing. It's illustrated by Maris Wicks, who I adore, um, and who I want to work with forever, if she'll let me. Um, and it's just, you know, it's Jim Ottaviani doing his, like, relatable, accessible science thing, and it's it's very moving and beautiful. Jim Ottaviani, uh, who is an Ann Arbor resident, and uh, we'll have to have him on the show to talk about primates. He's been on before to talk about Feynman, so. Yeah, you must. He's wonderful. Say hi to him for me. He is great. Um, and then, this is going to be sort of gloomy against my black shirt, but here it is. <laughs> Um, Jerusalem is a story about the founding of the nation of Israel in the 40s and the like, incredible turmoil that happened around this. The author is Boaz Yakin, and it's based on his family's experiences. Um, and the illustrator is the great, great Nick Bertozzi. Who oh, yeah. Wow. familiar with already. So this is just so you can see like how enormous this is. It's a real tomb. It's a big book. Yeah. Nick Pertosi is great. Yeah, I had the I had the privilege of meeting him at the university or Michigan, Michigan State University Comics Forum last month. Really, really intense guy. Where uh, he's he's got the soul of a writer. Where he's more interested in everything else around him than himself. Like when you talk to him, he's not going to tell you about him. He's going to ask you a whole bunch of probing questions about you. In that first three minutes that I talked to him, I think he he 
discovered more about me than Google knows. So. Yeah, no, he's amazing. He's, yeah. And he's also just like a thousand feet tall and has these like really intense eyes. Yeah, he so does. This whole experience of Nick Tortozzi is something. But, um, so finishing up my list of books that are coming out real soon now. Mm -hmm. um, this is another super serious book about world events. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Sarah Barron. <laughs> So Sarah is teaming up here with Cecil Castellucci, mm -hmm. who has written a lot of um, books for young adults and for um, pi and picture books, but this is her first foray into pure comics, I believe. Um, so she and Sarah collaborated on this incredibly sweet book about friendship. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, it's about ducks who are odd. Which I think is a pretty relatable experience. It, mm -hmm. it, Joseph Campbell said that everybody feels alone and special, right? And so that's <laughs> yeah. why the odd duck story is so potent. Well, fun. The crux of this is very funny. I'll, 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 I'm spoiler alert, okay? Right. I'm going like, to give away some details, but it's so charming. Um, the main character, Theodora, is obviously very eccentric, but thinks that she's completely normal. And then she gains a very eccentric neighbor whose eccentricities are completely different from hers. And she thinks he's just the biggest weirdo ever. But they become friends. And she has this sort of solicitous attitude about him, you know, that he's very strange, but really he's, he's a nice guy. Um, and then they're walking down the street in their duck town. And someone says, look at that odd duck. And they each think that the person is talking about the other. Ah. And then when they realize that the other one thinks that the odd duck comment was for them, they get really <laughs> mad at each other. And then so the, sort of the story is about accepting that it's okay to be an odd duck and that it's okay to have a friend who's an odd duck and that you can both be odd ducks together. It's really, <laughs> it's very adorable and very funny. Well, and, and Sarah Varon is one of those comic storytellers where her style has this children's book simplicity to it, but mm -hmm. she can capture an emotion that just grabs you by the throat like a wild dog. And I don't know what it is, but sweater weather? Oh, there, there are several parts of that book where I got choked up, right? So. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I mean, the anecdote that we always tell about um, Robot Dreams yeah. is that uh, Mark once witnessed an argument between the, uh, an adult collection librarian and a children's collection librarian about Robot Dreams. Um, because they were they couldn't agree where it should be shelved, if, if it should be shelved in children's or adult. And the adult collection, the children's collection librarian said, you, you can't understand robot dreams unless you, have a, you know, unless you have a child. And the adult collection librarian said, you can't understand robot dreams unless you've had a messy divorce. Oh, wow. And I mean, that is one of the sort of incredible strengths of her work is that she finds, I mean, talk about tapping into these universal experiences. She's sort of like the Naplu's ultra when it comes to that, right? She's just... Her work is somehow so broad and open that it encompasses like every feeling you've ever had. Yeah. Um. So last one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one more. <laughs> Let's uh, see it. Red Handed, the fine art of strange crimes, is this awesome literary noir story by the wonderful Matt Kent, who is um, getting a lot of very well deserved press for his um, Dark Horse comic series Mind Management right now, which is phenomenal. Um, and this book is him just at his best. He did a book, the first book of Matt's that I re read was this incredible book called um, Three Story. And he, you might also know his Super Spy, which is like this, looks like it's this gonna be a sort of charming romp about being a spy during World War II and turns out to be a really complex and sort of melancholy picture about how being a spy ruins your life. Um, so he's just this, he's someone who loves to take genre conventions and turn them on their heads. And this is absolutely him at his best doing that with noir crime stories. So that's Run that title by me one more, one more time. What was the title? Red Handed. Red, Red Handed. Handed. Okay. All right. Well, we will link to that in the show notes as well. Wow. We are already 15 minutes over if you guys wow. can believe that. Yeah, it goes I fast. Can. It goes <laughs> fast. <laughs> So I want to give you, the guest, Callista, uh, a chance for any final thoughts. Did I miss anything? Anything that I, you, were, you were hoping we would get to, but I didn't? Oh, God. Um. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. <laughs> if, if you're making that face, that means that I didn't, I didn't miss much. Wait, the uh, one thing I want to say, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm prolonging this, but I just finished reading this. Uh, it's volume four of right? um, Howard right Maury's story. A Bride's Story. Oh. And I cannot recommend this series highly enough. It's very strange and it's really wonderful. It's a portrait of um, like village life in 19th century Central Asia. 
um, which is not something I knew anything about. And now I feel like I'm sort of an expert. It's one of those books that takes you so deep inside, like a moment in time that you end up feeling like you've had the experience yourself. So highly recommended up to four volumes now, very pink as you can uh, tell, which I also, enjoy. I've heard wonderful things about that book. Mm -hmm. I've not read it yet, but I've heard terrific things about it. Um, Okay, well, then the, then I will close by saying uh, Astronaut Academy Day is May 14th. Uh, mm -hmm. com slash Astronaut Academy Day. One more thing that I want to throw out to the audience. A, a, what did I say? Oh, com slash AA Day. Sorry. Thank you, Matt. Um, I want to throw out one more thing to the audience. We've got a phone line now. We could actually take callers on the show if people are interested. Uh, but I, I don't want to trouble Matt, our beloved technical producer, who I prematurely age every two weeks when we do this show. Uh, I don't want to beleaguer him with another thing to manage unless you guys are interested. So if you are interested, if you would, would call in on the Comics Are Great show, next episode we've got George O'Connor of the uh, Olympian series from, from First Second Books. Uh, and if you would yes. like, like, like <laughs> to be part of that discussion and call in on the show and, and discuss something with us, let us know and we can uh, try to start using the, the phone lines where you could call on your telephone and be on the show. So with that, I will say thank you, Callista, for this wonderful conversation. It was really nice getting to know you. Thanks for having me. It was delightful. And thank you, Sharon Iverson. Sure, The sure. Amber District Library, comics.aadl.org. Callista Brilka, it can be found at firstsecondbooks.com. And first second on Twitter, is that right? I don't remember. Oh, rats. <laughs> Let me look real quick. I'm going to pull it up. It's zero one one first second on the Twitters. And thank you to Eric Kloster for managing the chat room and collecting all the links for these episodes. Thank you to Matt Dubé for put, pulling all of the various fragments and threads of the show and turning it into a thing. And thank you once again to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting on the show every two weeks. And that means I'll be back in two weeks. Uh, oh, the show will be collected at comicsgreat.com slash CAG75. And until next time, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.